Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We'll kind of reel you in a little bit. And uh, it's good to hear you talking. It's good to hear you enjoying each other's company. And, uh, you know, you, you need to know you minister to each other uh, by fellowshipping and encouraging, and that's a good thing. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we shared some testimonies in the afternoon service about what the Lord's been doing in our lives. And a lot of people were talking about how you as the group were ministering to them. So please keep that up. Keep doing that. Well, it is the 4th of July weekend, so we're going to start out with a patriotic song, a song that talks about how God has blessed our country, but then we're going to proceed from there and get into our, our regular worship time as well. So let's sing this song. You remain seated, if you will, but let's sing My Country, or let's see, uh, America the Beautiful 485. We'll sing the first, uh, the second, and the last stanza, 485. Father, most of us here are grateful uh, that we live in America. And we're grateful to be Americans. And uh, we're grateful because uh, you have poured out your grace on our country over the years. Uh, Father, we know that this is not a Christian nation. We know it's a nation that has Christians in it. And uh, we want to have an impact in our society. We want to have an impact uh, on our country. We pray that you'd help us to continue to do that. Uh, even though, Lord, we are at a time where it looks like uh, uh, things are moving away from um, that uh, Judeo-Christian ethic that we've, most of us have grown up with. And we just pray that you'd help us to be good testimonies, good witnesses uh, as we live out our time here. And, uh, Father, we pray now as we move on with the rest of our service that you would help us to uh, bring honor to you. And uh, as we uh, sing, as we look into your word, we pray that your spirit would be at work in our hearts and draw us closer to you. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Bob, for that <laughs> musical interlude. That's pretty good. Uh, let me do a few announcements for you. Uh, remind the ladies that next Saturday is the ladies' uh, book study, and uh, that will be here at church at 10 o'clock. Uh, Lynn has questions and so forth out on the table. If you need any of those, uh, check those out. But that is this coming Saturday the ninth. Uh, keep that in mind. And then two weeks from today, we're going to have our first picnic of the summer, and we are going to go out to Harvard Pines State Park. 
So uh, come prepared for that. Uh, two weeks from today, come prepared to go with us right after the morning service. We'll go out there and enjoy the afternoon together. Just bring, uh, we'll, we'll have a grill going, so bring something to throw on the grill, whether hot dogs or a steak for pastor or something like that. And, uh, and then maybe a dish to pass, and we'll just enjoy our time out there. Uh, members, uh, uh, three weeks from today is going to be our quarterly business meeting in the afternoon service, so keep that in mind. And then, as you know, uh, Grayling was not able to have their fireworks uh, like they normally would have had last night or tonight, but they were able to get a company to come do the fireworks on Tuesday. So there are going to be fireworks where it normally goes. It'll just be Tuesday night. And uh, Lynn and I will plan on being out in our normal spot, that grassy area behind uh, the Chinese restaurant, behind Dairy Queen. Uh, are you getting a hint? There's behind some very good food places if you're interested. But uh, we will meet there probably around 930 or so. And any of you that don't have a normal spot you go to, you're welcome to come and enjoy it with us. Just bring a, a lawn chair and uh, we'll watch the fireworks from back there. I believe that's all of our announcements. I'll remind you that we don't take up an offering anymore. Uh, we do have our baskets back here, so as you come or go, if the Lord's laid it on your heart to give, just put it in there, and uh, we'll apply it toward ministry need. Okay, uh, let's uh, get back into our singing time. Uh, we're going to be worshiping the Lord. Let's sing a song about the Lord Jesus. This one's called uh, My Jesus Fair, and I want you to notice the things that it says about him, about our wonderful Savior. Uh, let's sing this together. My. 
Bob, leave that slide up if you would. Look at those words, O love divine, O matchless grace. We're, we're, as we sing that, the, the thought is, is that we're in awe of that. What, what, what love could that be? What was divine love? What grace is that? It's matchless grace. It's incomprehensible that God should die for men. Think about that. I mean, you start with the Bible. God created Adam and Eve and put them in the garden. And, and he only gave them one simple uh, a rule, and they broke that. They turned to sin. And since then, every single one of us have born into sin. We are, we're natural sinners. No one needed to teach us how to sin. And yet, what is the, the antidote for that? God himself, through, through his son, came and died for our sins. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. If you ever forget just how wonderful God has been to you, just remember, he's provided your salvation, and he came and did the dirty work for us. That's what he's done. And that's why we're going to sing the next song as well. It's a song of worship, worthy of worship. He truly is worthy of our worship. if you would please and turn to the book of Matthew Matthew chapter 28 we're going to be reading from a passage that uh, we refer to as the Great Commission as Jesus was, was uh, getting ready to be taken up to the Father after his death burial and resurrection and he stayed around for a little while to instruct his disciples more. And then he's going to be taken up to the Father. And the disciples are going to be left. And then they were the ones that uh, he was going to use to establish the body of Christ. And here's what we find from him in uh, Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We're going to be talking a little bit about this as we uh, go on 
this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you provided for us uh, through your son. Uh, when there was nothing that we could do, when we were all under the, the curse of sin and the judgment that would result from that, uh, you provided for our salvation by sending the Lord Jesus to die on the cross, take the penalty of our sins that we deserve, and then allow us to experience his righteousness that we don't deserve uh, so that we could live in eternity with you. Thank you, Father. And uh, as we go on today, I pray that you would help us to uh, grasp that and grasp some of the things that uh, you've asked us to do because of that. And uh, may we honor you as we do. I'm praying this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn your hymnals one more time, please, to hymn number 308, Are You Washed in the Blood? Hymn number 308. one of the strange songs that people that don't necessarily understand the gospel, don't understand how we follow the Lord, that, that, that they would look at that song and think, what in the world are they talking about? I mean, if you were to take white garments and try to wash them in blood, or any garments, would they come out white? Not, not really, right? We know we're talking symbolism here, don't we? We know we're talking about the symbolism that since the Lord Jesus shed his blood for the, the penalty of our sins, that we are made white as snow before God as far as his righteousness and his holiness stands. That's what we're singing about. And uh, that whole idea of washing, we're going to talk about that today because we're going to talk about the idea of baptism, uh, being baptized. And uh, I'll, I'll fill you in a little bit more as we go. But thank you for singing. If you have your Bibles, take them out. We're going to go to a number of different places. Um, you could either turn with me every time I mention one of these verses, but I marked them so I can turn quickly. Or if you wanted, you could just go to the book of Acts, and we're going to look at several passages in Acts. And when we get there, uh, you'll be able to follow along with me then as we talk about uh, those particular things. 
Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the message time today. Father, please uh, work in our midst today. I pray that you'd help all of us to understand your word. And Father, especially as we're talking about an area where uh, obedience is, uh, is expected, uh, help us to be able to think this through and help us to be able to uh, submit to your word and uh, follow through on the things that you've given for us. I'm praying in Jesus' name, amen. Here's what I want to do. This is going to be a little different today. Um, it, I'm, I'm going to preach a sermon, but it's going to be a, a little different of a sermon. I'm going to ask questions and then answer my own questions for you. But, but I want us to talk about the concept of baptism today. And the reason I want to do this is, is in talking with some of you, there's a few of you that haven't been baptized yet, haven't, haven't experienced what we call believer's baptism, and therefore we want to have a baptism. Our last uh, picnic of the summer is going to be on August 27th. I believe it's the 27th, 27th or 28th. And uh, we are going to go out to the Muslinski's house. They live right on the Manistee River. It's a beautiful spot, beautiful grassy area. So after our morning service, we'll go out there and we're going to have a picnic together. But then as we have our picnic, we're going to have a baptism. But what I want to do is I want to talk about this for a while. And, and you're going to hear more about it as we go through the summer. Uh, I want to give you the opportunity, if you haven't had what we call believer's baptism, and, and I'll explain more as, as we go into that, um, that you will be able to have the opportunity to be baptized uh, this summer. If you haven't been, uh, you'll be able to. But in saying that, we need to discuss what do we mean by baptism? What exactly are we talking? Well, I've, uh, I pulled up on my phone our church's website. And on our website, you can go to the, the tab that says what we believe, and you can look into our church doctrinal statement. And here's what we say about baptism. Let me just read that particular section to you. This is where, where our church officially stands on the matter. It says, we believe that Christian baptism, or you might use the word believer's baptism, Christian baptism is the single immersion of a believer in water to show forth in a solemn and beautiful emblem our identification with the crucified buried, and risen Savior, through whom we died to sin and rose to new life, that baptism is to be performed under the authority of the local church, and that it is a prerequisite to the privileges of church membership. And then that statement goes on and talks about the next uh, ordinance, which would be the Lord's Supper. But I want us to talk about uh, some of those things today. Exactly what do we mean uh, by baptism? Uh, why are we uh, talking about it being important? And many of you know, uh, one of the reasons we have to go through this is there are a lot of different ways that, uh, that people look at, at baptism. And I'm not getting down on any of those that look at it different from us. And, and again, we'll talk about what the differences are. But I'm just trying to say, as we as a church, as we study the scriptures, we think this is, this is what it's saying, and therefore this is the path uh, that we're going to take. And uh, you are a part of our church, so we would like you to consider that, to think through that whole thing. Well, let's just kind of get started. The first question I'm going to ask is, why is baptism important? Well, we started by reading uh, Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. And one of the reasons that baptism is important is because Christ commanded us to do that. Christ commanded us to baptize. <laughs> Let me just remind you here. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So baptism was important to the Lord Jesus. It was so important um, to Jesus and to his disciples as they started the church that there's only one instance only one instance of someone who, who became a believer and did not get baptized. Now, there might be some instances where we don't hear about their baptism, but that's probably because it was, it was just something that was happening regularly. But as far as us actually being told of someone who didn't get baptized, there's only one instance. And uh, if it were a Sunday school class, I, I would ask for responses what that is. But actually, the, the only person was the thief on the cross. When, uh, when he talked to Jesus about, about being with him, he recognized that Jesus was the, the Messiah. And Jesus said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Well, he didn't have an opportunity to get baptized. But everywhere else, if you look about it, the, the um, idea was is that when people became believers, they were to be baptized. Jesus said 
to, to baptize them. The early church practiced it. And we'll, we'll look at a number of those instances as we go on. But it, it was important. It was a way that a believer would initially uh, claim that they were a believer. It was a way of them showing to put people around them that they were a believer. They were a Christian. They, they received Jesus as their Savior and so forth. And uh, we'll, we'll look at that as we go. Let's, let's, let's look at a couple other things. Baptism is a symbol. You need to keep that in mind. It is a symbol. A number of things that we do are symbols. And we as a church don't believe that when you do these symbols, they give you any spiritual points before God. Like, for instance, we have communion. And we'll be doing communion next week. And when we do communion, you're not going to become a Christian because you do communion. Uh, rather, since you are a Christian, you do communion to remind you what Jesus has done for us. That's why it says on the front of the table, this do in remembrance of me. Well, baptism is the same way. You're not gaining spiritual leverage with God, or spiritual brownie points, as I like to say, but rather it's symbolizing something that has already happened to you. And, and in this case, it symbolizes, first of all, identification with Christ. With Christ with, through his death, through his burial, and through his resurrection. I'm going to turn, and, and you can either turn there or write them down and look them up later, but I do encourage you to actually read them so you know it's not just what I'm saying. You know that it's what God the Holy Spirit has given us through the scriptures. Uh, but the first place I'm going to go is Romans chapter 6. And in uh, Romans chapter 6, one of the things that Paul is doing is talking about the fact that we have died to sin. Just because God pours out his grace on us and, and, and extends to us forgiveness doesn't mean that we can keep on sinning because God forgives us anyway. No. He's saying, no, we're dead to sin. And then he uses the illustration of baptism. And, and I want to read here in uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. He says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were baptized with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So you see both the ideas of there. We died to sin, we're buried with him, and we raised again to him. Let me tell you this, though. In that passage in Romans chapter 6, it's not talking about water baptism. It's not talking about the type of baptism that we would do in our baptism tank or that we're going to do at the end of the summer in the river. It's talking about a spiritual baptism that happened to you the moment you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, there are some groups that, uh, that um, they uh, want to accentuate uh, certain ministries of the Holy Spirit, and they talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they think that's when all kinds of uh, miraculous things happen. Maybe you'll speak in tongues or, or other things like that could happen. But spirit baptism happens to every single believer at the moment you're saved. And it's not what, what causes uh, miraculous type things to happen. Now, it did happen in the early church because God was showing them that something new was happening. But for us, the moment we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are baptized by the Spirit. And now, what does baptism mean? We're going to look at it a little bit. But the word baptize actually means to place into or to dip into, and the Spirit places you into the church of Jesus Christ. When you are saved, every person that knows Jesus as their Savior has been placed into the church of Jesus Christ. Now that's talking about the church universal, the whole church, the whole body of Christ. Uh, we have our local church here, but this is talking about all believers together. We're all placed into the church. So if you have received Jesus as your Savior, you were baptized into Christ. And the symbolism is that Jesus died on the cross. You have died to sin as well. Jesus was buried, and then Jesus rose to new life, and it's symbolizing our rising to new life. Because the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. We're, we're made new. And we're not made sinless at this point. That is coming in the future. But we're made new, and we're given the ability to walk in newness of life, even though we're going to struggle with things and we have to overcome things, but, but we're going to be moving in that direction. So that's the symbolism you see with, uh, with uh, us being baptized into Christ. So that happens at salvation. Okay? Uh, there's uh, some other symbolizing. It, it symbolizes being uh, identified with uh, the church. 
uh, not just the church uh, universal, but even our individual churches. I'm going to turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says this to the church in Corinth. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Now, that verse shows it even more clearly than Romans chapter 6 does, that the baptism is talking about is a spiritual baptism. You have been placed into the church. And we've all been made to do that, no matter who we were, whether it was the, the Jews from the Old Testament or now the Gentiles of, of this world, whether you're a slave, whether you're a free, whatever you are, you receive Christ, you're placed into the church. And, and that symbolism shows that we are now unified together. If you read more in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you'd see that we're unified together. Uh, we come from different backgrounds. Uh, the, Lord, uh, the Lord allows us to serve in so many different ways, uh, that sort of a thing. But it's symbolizing that we are part of the body of Christ. In other words, it's like saying, I'm one of these guys now. When you get baptized, you're saying to the rest of the world, I am one of the Christians. I'm, I'm one of that world. Now, in the USA, that's not that big of an issue, really, at least not yet. But in other countries, uh, this is a very important decision. In other countries where there's persecution going on, if you choose to be baptized, you have made a very public statement, and your life could be in danger. Uh, or, or other things. I mean, you're at least in danger of persecution. It certainly sees there. But you are identifying with the body of Christ. You know, you go around to other places in the world, and there's other religious groups that are, that are not within Christianity, and they want to maintain political control of the areas where they're at. And boy, if they know you're a Christian, uh, you could be in trouble. And, and one of the ways they'll know is you were baptized. You, you made a public acknowledgement that you're part of that group. So there, there's a price to pay uh, for some of them overseas. Thankfully, we haven't had to experience that here. But uh, it, it can be tough. Actually, some people do experience it here in some ways. And in, in some uh, places, uh, depending on what your family background is, your family might have been a part of a particular uh, group, a particular religious group. And then when you become a Christian, a, a born-again Christian, and you get baptized, and it can really create some issues, and it can cause family problems. I know people that have had to experience that. That's not political uh, persecution, but it can still be... Uh, persecutions or problematic anyway. So yes, uh, baptism certainly does that. Another thing that baptism symbolizes is the idea of being cleansed from sin. Now, baptism doesn't cleanse you from sin. At least water baptism doesn't cleanse you from sin. But it's symbolizing what happened to you when you received Jesus as Savior. When you received Jesus as Savior, you were cleansed from sin. So now when we are baptized... We're symbolizing that I've had my sins forgiven. I've been washed. I've been made new. I'm going to turn and, uh, and look here in Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to begin reading at verse 25. And this is in a passage where he's talking about husbands and wives and how they should be interacting with each other. He says this to husbands, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now, he didn't cleanse her by the washing of water. It's a symbolism. He cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. In other words, it was the word that brought the cleansing. Well, what is the word? The word is talking about the gospel. That Jesus is, and it's the whole story about what Jesus did for us. Came and died on the cross. Pay the, the penalty for our sins. That's how Christ has washed his bride and, and presented her a clean bride. Okay, um, So it's talking about the symbolism of what he's done for us. I'm going to turn one more time to the book of Titus. Paul is writing to a young pastor by the name of Titus. And he's, he's given him instruction and encouragement. And he says this in chapter 3, verse 5. Well, let me go back to verse 4. He says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see? That, again, that washing isn't the water that goes over us, but it's the spiritual thing that has happened. The, the washing of, of uh, regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. So water baptism pictures 
the Holy Spirit baptizing us into the body of Christ. Now, Paul said to me just before we came out here today, uh, if you've been coming to Sunday school, you know that Paul's teaching about the Holy Spirit. He's going through the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And when he found out what I was doing today, he said, Pastor, you're not going to ruin my Sunday school lesson, are you, next week? He said, I'm going to be talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit next week. So if you want to learn more about that, come to Sunday school, and, and you'll be able to hear that. But, but I just told Paul, well, we'll just work together on this thing and, uh, and uh, make that work. So, but, but that's the idea. Baptism is a symbol of what the Holy Spirit has done for us. So that's, that's why it's important. That's why what it symbolizes. It symbolizes what God has done in our lives. Okay, let me ask a couple other questions. And we'll look through those as we go. The next question is, is baptism necessary for salvation? In other words, do you need to get baptized to be saved? And, and the reason I have to ask this is there are several uh, Christian groups out there that teach that part of your salvation is being baptized. You receive grace from God or something of that by going through the act of baptism. I remember I was in a church one day. I was getting ready for a funeral. And it was another church uh, that the family had chosen for the funeral. And I was walking with the pastor. They were of a different group than we are. And the pastor was, I don't know how we got on it, but he started talking to me about a couple of difficulties he had with some of his members. And he said, boy, if it wasn't for the fact that they were baptized, I wouldn't think they were Christian. Well, if that's the case, maybe they aren't Christian. Because the scriptures never say that you receive salvation because you're baptized. Now, it's talking about baptism in relation to the uh, salvation, but if you'll see the verses we've already read, it's talking about the baptism of the, of the Spirit. The Spirit has placed us into Christ. And that's where our, our cleansing happened, and water is just symbolizing that, and so forth. So, is baptism necessary for salvation? Well, the scriptures abundantly state that salvation is by grace alone. I'm going to go back to the book of Ephesians again. And uh, this time I'm in Ephesians chapter 2. This is a verse that many of us have known all of our lives. But uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. In other words, it's not something that you've done, including being baptized. Going through the act of baptism is something that you would have to do. That's not how you've been saved. You've been saved through grace, by grace, through faith. It's God's grace, and it's our faith that he's giving us this grace. Uh, that's how we've been saved. And he goes on to say, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's, works are the things we do. It's not about the things we do, even religious things that we do. Now, God wants us to do good things. In fact, if you read the next verse, it says that God's created us so that we can do good things. Good things are, we, we want to do good things. We want to do righteous things. We want to live right. But we do them... After we've been saved. We don't do them in order to get saved. Okay? So the scriptures are making it abundantly clear that it's not uh, your baptism. Uh, and one other. I'm going to go ahead and read this for you. We talked about it already. The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, uh, he couldn't get baptized. And if baptism was necessary for salvation, Jesus would have had to perform more miracles. He would have had to somehow, some way, allow this guy to get off the cross and to be baptized before he died. You know, like maybe they take him down, they pull the nails out, and, and as they take him down, some Christians grab him and dunk him in a tank of water, and then he dies from a heart attack or whatever people in crucifixion did. But that's not what happened. That didn't happen at all. And uh, so let me, let me just read this story in a verse, or chapter 23 of Luke, beginning at verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? But we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Only instance in, in scripture where, where someone uh, became a believer and didn't get baptized, but the reason was is because there was no way you could. But baptism is not a necessary part of salvation. It's something that we're commanded. It's a necessary part uh, of being obedient to the Lord, 
I mean, if you receive Jesus as your Savior, you want to follow him. You want to do what he says and go back to the Great Commission. Je Jesus told the early, uh, the early disciples, uh, when you're starting these churches, uh, evangelize them, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It was something that he wanted to do. He wanted these people to identify with his body. But it's not because uh, we're earning salvation and so forth. Obedience results from our salvation. And therefore, we follow through on the steps. Don't put it before it. Don't put the cart before the horse in this uh, particular case. So no, the answer to that question is salvation is not, our baptism is not necessary for salvation. It's just an outcome of salvation. Um, couple, another question. Who should be baptized? As we talk about that, who, who should get baptized? Well, there's an order in the New Testament when you see salvation happening. And if you're in Acts, we're going to start in Acts chapter 2, and we're going to look at a couple of these instances. But the, the order in salvation is that, first of all, the gospel is preached. The, the, the good news that God's provided for your salvation, Jesus died and paid the penalty. Remember he told Adam and Eve, when, when, Adam and Eve, when you sin, you will die? Well, we're, that we're all under the condemnation of spiritual death. Jesus suffered that for us when he died on the cross. And that is the good news. The good news for us is that our salvation has been provided for. Uh, we just need to accept it. And that's the second step is people accept the message. They accept it by faith, believing that, okay, God did provide for our salvation this way. And that's faith. And by the way, it is faith. Uh, you're not going to be able to get out some scientific test and prove that this is all true. You, you can look at the scriptures and, and uh, from a... From a literal standpoint, you can find that that is exactly what the scriptures teach. Uh, but as far as proving it, you can't. It's a matter of faith. You're accepting it. And then after people receive the message, then they're baptized. So you see, baptism is not uh, receiving or not giving you salvation. It comes after salvation. But in our current question here is who should be baptized? Well, the answer is, is those people who have received the message of Jesus Christ. Those people who have turned to Jesus Christ for salvation. Let me show you. If you're in Acts chapter 2, let's just kind of walk through Acts. Because there was a number of times when the apostles would preach the gospel and then people were responding to it. But in Acts chapter 2, go to verse 40 and 41. Well, we'll just go to verse 40 first. And with many other words he, meaning Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Notice the order. Peter preached it first. They received his word. They received it. They believed it. Then they were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls to them. So that's the first. The, the, you, see the, you see the steps in there. But they believed first. Then were baptized. Go up to chapter 8 of Acts. In chapter 8, this is when... Uh, uh, Philip, who was uh, one of the early uh, people in the church, went to Samaria and preached the gospel. And look at verse 12 of chapter 8. But when they, meaning the Samaritans, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. They believed first. Peter preached the gospel. They believed it. Then they were baptized. But it's, it's people who have turned to him They've already turned to the gospel for salvation. So again, in answering a question, who should be saved? Well, it's the people who have heard the gospel, who have responded to it in belief, and then they are baptized. Uh, in that same chapter, chapter 8, go down to verse 36. This is where uh, uh, Philip is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch. He was an, basically he was an Old Testament believer. He was worshiping God from an Old Testament standpoint. And he's coming back from that worship. And now the, the gospel is proclaimed to him. Go to uh, verse 36. It says, Now as they went down the road, meaning Philip and this eunuch, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said to him, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. Now, I thought about not even mentioning this, but there is actually a, a textual variant with this. Some people wonder if verse 37 was actually there, if it was added. But if it was added, it was added very early by the early church by someone who wanted to make sure we understood that you've got to believe the gospel before you're baptized. 
So either way, I, I accept it as a, as a part of the scriptures uh, that, that he's saying you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he did believe, and then he was baptized. All right. Now go up to chapter 16 in the book of Acts. In the chapter 16, this is one of my favorite stories of someone turning to Jesus for salvation. This is the story of the Philippian jailer. Okay? Uh, he, was, he was a guy in Philippi. He would have been a Roman soldier. He was in charge of the jail there. Paul and Silas had been thrown in the jail. And then uh, there were some things that happened. There was an earthquake, actually, and, and they didn't run away. And the jailer was amazed by it. And he had been listening to them singing hymns all night long. And we pick up the story in verse 30 of chapter 16. Well, let's start at verse 29. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He'd heard them singing and talking about it all night long. So they said to him, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Notice Paul didn't say, uh, you need to be baptized and you'll be saved. No, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, when he had brought them into the house, he set food before them and rejoiced. Look what he rejoiced in, having believed in God with all his household. It doesn't say he rejoiced because he was baptized and now he's going to heaven. He rejoiced because he believed. That's the point. So believers are the ones who are baptized. Now, are there some people who would take this passage and say, uh, it, it talks about his whole household, so there must have been infants there, and the infants uh, were baptized as well. You don't see that. You, you don't, they don't talk about, how old were the people in his household? You don't know. Apparently they were old enough to understand because it says here that they, they preached the message to everyone in his household. They understood it and they believed. So it wasn't someone, something that was forced on a young person that didn't know any better and they just baptized him. No, it was people who were able to believe the gospel. Whatever, whatever age they were and so forth. It would, it would preclude infants as far as that goes. But uh, whoever it was, they believed. By the way, household back in those days meant more than just your own wife and kids. It also meant if you had any servants, they were part of your servant household and so forth. So there were several people probably that would have been preached to and, uh, and received the gospel. So it does raise the question, though. First, first of all, the answer to the question was who should be baptized, and, and we would answer believers are who get baptized. That's why we call it believer's baptism. But it raised the question, what about infants? Because there are plenty of groups that will baptize infants, but why? Well, you need to know that there's a theological issue going on as to why some groups um, will, will baptize infants. First of all, we here at our church, uh, we, we, we believe uh, that the scriptures teach that God, God raised up Israel, God has a promise and purposes for Israel, but then when the church came, the church is a separate entity from Israel. And that now as the church came, um, God is saving people in the church. We receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, and then we're baptized and so forth. But we believe eventually God's going to finish what he started with Israel. That's where the book of Revelation comes in. You see in the book of Revelation that God picks up his program with Israel and actually <coughs> gives them all the promises that he said he was going to give them. And that's what the book of Revelation is all about. Well, there are some people in the church that believe that when Israel rejected Jesus, God rejected Israel. They rejected Jesus, and God just basically threw them away. And then now the church becomes the spiritual Israel, and we have replaced Israel. And uh, therefore, Israel had a sign of their covenant, and the sign was circumcision. But the sign in the church of the covenant is baptism, according to these people. And so they say, therefore, when we have children, just like their children were circumcised. By the way, stop and think about it for a minute. It was only the males that were circumcised. Mm -hmm. But now they're saying in the church, uh, when we have children, we would baptize them, and that brings them into our covenant community. In, in other words, it brings them into salvation. They become a part of the family of God. That's what these people say. There's a problem, though. You never see the New Testament church saying any of that. 
You never see them saying anything. In fact, if anything, you see them still waiting for Jesus to return as Israel's Messiah. That's what you see. So we, we would not follow that particular path. We're, we're, on, we're on a different strain as far as that. We believe that God's still going to do what he did for Israel. God did not throw Israel away. He's still going to keep his promises. The church is different. And the church never was commanded to baptize any babies. You will not find a single, not one instance in the Bible of a baby being baptized. You won't find it. And I challenge you to look that up. The closest you'll come is stories like what we just read of the Philippian jailer where people in his household were baptized. But it never, ever uses the words for infants or small children. It just never, ever does. And so we would say that's, that's not the case. So we, we don't practice infant baptism. And I know several of you were probably baptized as infants. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to say that those groups are bad groups. Because uh, I know some churches that, that, that they will baptize infants, but they still preach the gospel like we preach. I, I don't get how they put all that together like that. So I'm not trying to, to say that all of them are bad and we're good. That, that's not what I'm trying to say at all. But I am trying to say when it comes to baptism, we, we don't look at it that way because of that theological difference. By the way, that's called... Uh, Dispensationalists, which is what we are, we believe God works through different time periods in different ways sometimes. Always, it, salvation is always by faith, but he still works in different ways. And they're what's called uh, covenant theology, and, and, and they're, just, they're just different from where we are in some of those things. But we don't practice infant baptism. So therefore, what we would say, if you were baptized as a baby... That's okay. There's not anything bad that's going to happen. We don't say that. But we would say, when did you receive Jesus as your Savior? If you believed it was when you were baptized as a baby, we would say, well, we don't believe you're saved because that, you didn't have faith at that point in time. But what, what I know most of you that, that have had that happen, you, you, and you grew up, you, there was some point in time where you did receive Jesus as your Savior. We would say, okay, now's the time that you would be baptized because now you're a believer. You, when you receive Jesus as your Savior... You're going to be baptized with all the symbolism that we just talked about. Symbolizing that the Spirit has placed you into the body of Christ. Symbolizing that your sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ. Symbolizing all those things. That, that's what we would practice. And so what I'm kind of expecting is when we get to the end of the summer and we have this baptism, if some of you want to be baptized, maybe you were never baptized in the first place, or maybe you were baptized as an infant and now you uh, want to be baptized as a believer. And, and that's, that's what we would operate. Again, we're not trying to throw any, anything toward those groups and, and say that they're bad. That's not what we mean at all. We just disagree with them on that particular issue. Okay? Uh, but, but think about that. If you were baptized as an infant but now you know you're a believer, now you know that you're trusting Jesus as your Savior, we would invite you to be baptized. And by the way, if you want to join our church and actually become one of the members, and you don't have to join our church. Some of you have been here for years and years and years and you're not a member of our church, and that's fine. We're glad you're here and you can benefit from all that's going on and we benefit from having you here with us. But if you want to be a member, which means when we vote and do other things like that, you have to be a member. One of the things is that you have to have had believers' baptism. And so we would encourage you uh, to do that and so forth. So as far as infant baptism, we would not hold to that. Uh, I personally believe it can be a little harmful, the idea of infant baptism, because I know people that were baptized as infants, and because of that they think they're saved, and they never consider the gospel after that. And I think it, it can blind them sometimes to considering the gospel. They need to realize, wait a minute, you still have a need. You are still a sinner, and you need your sins forgiven for what Jesus did. And it didn't happen because you were baptized. It happens because you turned to him in faith. By grace through faith is how we receive forgiveness of sin. So we would, we would encourage you in that particular way. Well, let me ask a couple more questions before we end here. Uh, this question is, how long after one has believed should one wait to be baptized? Because frankly, uh, in our day and age, it used to be back then when people turned to Christ as salvation, they'd baptize, them right away, or they'd baptize them right away. You saw the Philippian jailer, they did that on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached that first sermon and 3,000 people uh, received the gospel and then they were baptized. I mean, they were baptized right away. But we don't see that happening in today's churches. Some churches do. Some churches keep their water full all the time. And if you were to receive Christ today, they'd invite you up and they'd baptize you right away. 
we get dead mice in our baptism once in a while. So I'm just telling you, you better hope we clean the water before, before that happens. But, uh, but no, how long should one wait? Well, uh, the biblical example, again, is right away. Uh, except for the, the believer, on, except for the thief on the cross, uh, everyone else appears to have been baptized. And they were probably baptized right away. I do believe, though, that in today's day and age, we're talking about 2,000 years later now, uh, there have been a lot of developments, a lot of different groups have developed uh, their own uh, theological thinking on the matter, so there's all kinds of ideas out there. I think it's a good thing that we take a little bit of time to, to teach and to help people understand exactly what baptism is about. So I'm okay with it not being right after you receive Christ. Uh, take time to learn what it's about and then go uh, in that route. And, and you, you would do that. So as far as how long should it take, well, as soon as you get to the point to where uh, you can understand what's going on and understand why you're being baptized, uh, then that would happen. Uh, but here's a question that, that someone might ask. How old should children be who believe before they are baptized? Well, I mean, uh, children can get saved when they're uh, five, six, seven, eight years old if they truly understand the gospel. Uh, some of them can and if they are, then uh, when should they get baptized? Well, I, I think a rule of thumb would be something like this. It depends on the child. Do they show understanding? Do they understand the gospel? First of all, they know that it's because of faith in Christ. And then do they understand that baptism is a symbol that they are a part of the body of Christ? If they understand those things, then, then you could baptize them. It doesn't really matter, I, I don't think, as far as that goes. Uh, Whitney, were you eight when you were baptized? I think Whitney was the first person ever baptized in our tank back here. Uh, she was eight, but she received the Lord when she was five. But we just, we just waited for a little while. We wanted her to make sure she understood what was going on and so forth. And, and that's the idea. So if you're old enough to make an informed decision, and if you're old enough to remember it for the rest of your life, then that would be a good time uh, to be baptized, I would say. Now, an infant wouldn't fit any of that criteria, as, as far as I'm concerned. All right, here's another question. Should a person who has been baptized, uh, maybe as, as an infant, uh, should they be rebaptized? Or is there ever a case of someone who would be rebaptized? Um, that, that kind of a thing. Um, an interesting question. First of all, I think if you were baptized as an infant, that wasn't believer's baptism. So yeah, I would say, I would say then you would be baptized. There's actually an instance in the, the New Testament, if you're still in the book of Acts, go to Acts chapter 19. There's an instance that is... Similar to that, but for different reasons. I mean, they weren't baptized as infants, but they weren't baptized as, as Christians, if you will. And we're in Acts chapter 19. What, let, me, let me give you some background. What happens is, remember the book of Acts is a transition time. So there's different groups are responding to the gospel at different times and different things are happening. Well, if you remember, John the Baptist was, was baptizing people in the wilderness before Jesus came. John the Baptist, he was not baptizing Christians. He was baptizing Jews. And he was baptizing Jews because they were repenting of their sin. Uh, there were a lot of Jewish people that were supposed to be waiting for God's promises to be unfolded. And, uh, and a lot of them just got cold and were just living life and weren't thinking about that. Well, John the Baptist came to wake people up. Look, God is going to send the Messiah. The Messiah is coming. You need to turn. So he was trying to get Jews to uh, turn back to God and, and basically rededicate their lives to follow God. And then when they were baptized, it was symbolizing that they were turning back to God. I hope I didn't ruin my afternoon service now, but that's what we're going to be looking at today in the afternoon service. But they would, they would turn back to God. Okay, well, in Acts chapter 19, the apostles came up on a group of people who had been baptized by John. But they were Jews who were looking for the Messiah to come. So they were not... Christian. Now, they, they were believers in the sense, remember, it's a transition time. There's like Old Testament believers mixed in with New Testament believers, but they weren't Christians yet. They were following God, but as a God of the Old Testament and on, waiting for the Messiah to come. And they're going to be challenged that, well, you know what? The Messiah has come. Here's who he is. Let's look at this in Acts chapter 19, beginning at verse 1. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having uh, passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We do not know so, uh, we, we do not, uh, let's see, we have not so much as heard whether there even is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. 
Then Paul said to them, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they heard that Jesus was, and by the way, Jesus Christ, the word Christ means Messiah, so it's Jesus the Messiah. As soon as they heard who the Messiah was, they believed. And so they were baptized into uh, Jesus. Now they became Christians, is, is what, what the point is going on there. And so that's an instance of them being baptized again. That's what, that's what I started with all this with, is they were re-baptized because their first baptism wasn't believer's baptism, or wasn't Christian baptism. It was, it was an Old Testament type of baptism. And now that they turned to Jesus Christ as the Messiah, now they were baptized as a Christian. Well, I would say this kind of correlates to what goes on with infant baptism, in the sense that when an infant is baptized, it's not believer's baptism. So when they become a believer... Then they get baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And now it's symbolizing that I am a believer now, so I'm going to get baptized and let the whole world know that I am a believer. So, so that's the idea. So in that case, there's a case for rebaptism. Now, I was rebaptized, interestingly enough. I was baptized when I was either seven or eight years old, actually in Hawaii. Uh, my dad was in the military there, and uh, we went to a good church to preach the gospel, and, and I had told them that I received Christ as Savior, and they, they interviewed me, and, and I knew all the answers, and, and so forth, so they baptized me. And, you know, I got kind of ripped off, though. We were in Hawaii, and I didn't get baptized in the ocean. I got baptized in a tank like this in a church, because it was in the winter. It was probably cold. It was probably only in the 70s. So, uh, so we got baptized inside. One of my brothers got baptized in the ocean, but I'm, I'm digressing here. As, as we moved back to the States, and as I, start, as I was living uh, as a teenager, I, I got involved in all kinds of... I was not living for the Lord. I, I, I was not... I, I wasn't... I mean, we went to church. We, we went to a Baptist church and so forth. But I wasn't walking with the Lord, and I was living... I was living a, an ugly life. I mean, there's things, uh, there's things that some of you have never heard about me, and you're never going to, Lord willing. And, uh, and, and that's okay. But it was very obvious that I wasn't living as a believer. I finally come to the conclusion that I never was a believer. That even though I knew the facts, it had not penetrated my life. The scriptures say, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Uh, that's 2 Corinthians 5.17, I believe. And uh, I was not a new creation. Never had been. And so when I was 16, I turned to the Lord. I asked the Lord to change me and to make me into who he wanted me to. And the Lord did. He, he changed me. It, it was a, and to me, it was dramatic. I, I could see all the ways that the Lord had changed me. And so afterwards, I got to thinking, you know what? Even though I was baptized at 7 or 8, I wasn't a believer. So I asked my church, I said, would you, would you re-baptize me because I am a believer now? And, and they did. I, our church had a baptism service. And, and I was rebaptized at, at that point in time. But again, the reason was is because the first time, I don't believe I was actually a believer. And when I, when I knew I was a believer, then I decided to be baptized. Now, someone might also ask the question, well, what about if you are a believer, but you really backslide? You backslide really far, and you're not walking with the Lord anymore, and so forth. Well, then you finally repent, and you get back to the Lord. Uh, should you be rebaptized there? There's no instance of that ever happening in the scriptures. What the scriptures do say, if you turn to 1 John 1, 9, you don't have to turn there, but 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. You just need to repent and turn back to the Lord, but the scriptures never show someone that backslid and then deciding to get baptized again. Uh, that doesn't mean that if someone wanted to do it just from a symbolic standpoint, I suppose they could just to make a statement to people, but there's no instance of the scriptures ever doing that, so I, I personally have never participated in that kind of a thing with someone else. If, if you were baptized as a believer, you had believer's baptism. So, so that would be the idea. So I would say, no, you don't need to be rebaptized. If, if you were already a believer, you just fell away for a while and come back, uh, then no. You don't need to do that. Um, there's, there's other questions and so forth we could ask. Uh, lots of different things within the church, like what's the right type of baptism? You know, there's the baptism we do where they actually dunk you down in the water. Uh, some churches practice pouring. Some churches practice sprinkling, and they've got names for all that. I'm not necessarily going to get in to all those things. Uh, we practice uh, immersion because we believe that best shows what they did in, in the New Testament. In fact, that shows what the word, the word actually means to be dipped into to be plunged into. Uh, 
there's, there's uh, um, other writers who are using Greek that would use that word. They're talking about doing dishes, and they talk about taking a dish and putting it into the rinse water, and they use the word baptized. They plunged it into the dishwasher, uh, dishwater and, and took it out. So therefore, we practice immersion. We, we think that that's the, the best way to picture all of, all of those things. So that's, that's the way that we would go. So my question is now, and, and I don't need a response now, but I want you to think about it. Uh, do you need to have believer's baptism? Have you ever, have you, since you've received Christ as Savior, have you been water baptized to show to everyone else, to give a testimony to everyone else that you are a believer? If you have not and you need to do that, come and talk to me over the next few weeks. And uh, we're going to put together a service so that we can have a baptism at the end of the summer. And it will be a glorious time. It'll be, we, we will have so much. First of all, we always have a good time when we're picnicking anyway. Put food before Baptist and we're a happy bunch, you know. But, uh, but we're going to have a baptism and we're going to just worship the Lord in that as part of your testimony that what God has done in your life. So if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me. And uh, we, will, we will put all that together uh, toward the end of the summer. And I'll spend some more time talking with you and helping uh, think through the issues and so forth as all that goes. In the afternoon services for the next several weeks, probably for, it might even go all the way up until we do the baptism, we're going to be talking about baptism things in the afternoon service. We're going to be looking at different stories. Like today we're going to look at John the Baptist baptism, uh, even though I already spilled the beans on on all of it. But we're, we're going to be talking about it. But if, if you would like to be baptized, if you haven't had believer's baptism yet, come and see me and uh, we will do that. By the way, if for whatever reason you decide not to or, or you, you, you just have a difference uh, with us on that, uh, we're okay with that. We're not going to throw you out the door or anything like that. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're a part of our fellowship and so forth. But we would love to rejoice with you in your salvation. So we invite you to come and be a part of that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, providing the Lord Jesus Christ who came and died on the cross to take our penalty on him and uh, to pay the penalty for us and then give us his righteousness so we can stand as righteous before you. Thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that if there's anyone here today that hasn't received the gift of eternal life, that you would help them to see that, that they just need to, by faith, believe that the Lord Jesus Christ has provided for their salvation. And uh, Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we talk about this baptism thing over the coming weeks and months that uh, uh, we would be able to rejoice together as we rejoice in what you've done in our lives. Thank you. Uh, now, Lord, as we go our way, keep us safe. Help us to honor you this week. I'm praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, sing one more song together. Hymn number 324, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. 324, and we'll just sing the first and the last stanza. 324. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same. Bless your afternoon.